now show that the Chinese social media platform is pushing anti-Israel posts, possibly strengthening support for Hamas in the U.S. Congressman Mike Gallagher wrote in an op-ed a few days ago saying, Many young Americans support Hamas because of TikTok. He cited a poll stating that over half of college-aged Americans say Hamas attacks on Israel on October 7th were justified. He wrote in the article for the Free Press that, quote, a growing number of Americans rely on TikTok for their news. Today, TikTok is the top search engine for more than half of Gen Z. Officials num official numbers from TikTok show that pro-Palestinian posts are getting over 10 times more that views than on that platform should be pro-Israel posts. The congressman abolished. Quote, we know for a fact that the CCP Eliminated. uses TikTok to push its propaganda and censor views that diverge from the party line. He concluded by saying that completely banning TikTok in the U.S. quote protects our public square from the surveillance and malign influence, censorship, and propaganda of a foreign adversary. A reporter spoke with an expert on Chinese propaganda to learn more about TikTok's influence on America's youth. Make sure to tune in to the Capitol Report at 5 p.m. Eastern to Pacific for the full report. Now, Senator Bernie Sanders speaks out during a CNN interview on the out ongoing Israel-Hamas conflict and where he stands on a ceasefire. Here's what he said. So I think clear to most people, what Hamas did, and Hamas is an awful terrorist organization, is they slaughtered 1,400 people in cold blood. Israel has a right to defend itself. But what Israel does not, in my view, have a right to do is to kill thousands and thousands of innocent men, women, and children who had nothing to do with that attack. While acknowledging the right of Israel to defend itself, Sanders also underscores the need to protect innocent civilians. But at the same time, Sanders is pushing back against calls for a ceasefire between Israel and Hamas. He pointed to Hamas's dedication to turmoil chaos and the destruction of the state of israel notably sanders who is jewish emphasizes that even arab countries understand the need to neutralize hamas and believe that a ceasefire won't aid the cause former president trump takes the stand not everybody has a phone so it really levels the field um as far as if you don't have a phone i don't have a phone kind of like a uniform everybody's the same but there is some pushback from parents critics say the policy limits parents ability to reach their children especially in an emergency just saying i love you in case something happens another question is enforcement a report from the university of michigan children's hospital found that 97 percent of kids ages 11 to 17 use their phones during the school day which can make taking them away easier said than done for teachers and administrators schools with cell phone bans in place say the policy is critical to reversing learning loss that happened during the pandemic in los angeles matt finn fox news fox five we have a group supporting israel on the other side a group supporting palestinians and some students feel that they're threatened and harassed after demonstrating and unfortunately one student was involved in a hit and run incident and some are calling it a hate crime authorities opened a hate crime investigation after an arab muslim student was hit while walking the private university says the incident was reported to police before 2 p.m friday according to stanford the victim said the driver made eye contact with the victim accelerated and struck the victim and then drove away while shouting expletive you people the suspect was described as a, quote, white male in his mid-twenties with short, dirty blonde hair and a short beard and drove a black SUV. The victim, Abdul Wahab Omira, said, my hope is to ignite a spark of empathy, a desire for change, and a call to action to foster a society where love overpowers hate. A student said that Omira is not involved in the campus Palestinian demonstration, but he visited the victim in the hospital, saying he was in physical pain. Unfortunately, it wasn't something that was coming completely out of the blue because as students, we were already concerned about our safety. People calling us terrorists, uh, people uh, saying, oh, we'll report you guys to the FBI because you support terrorism. I'm the first to condemn Hamas when they do something wrong. What is right is right, and what is wrong is wrong. However, as for the hit and run, the Stanford Review reports that the victim is referred to as a pathological liar by students who know the victim and concerned that the story could be fabricated.
Uh, personally, I feel pretty safe, but I can only speak as like a, an Asian male on a campus. Upon receiving the campus hit and run email, one student told us she was shocked and students condemned the reckless behavior. CHP is currently investigating. In Stanford, California, David Lamb, NTD News. Honduras and Venezuela fleeing poverty, violence, and political instability in their home countries. The Biden administration has asked Congress for another $14 billion in border funding to expedite removals and hire more agents and staff. Israeli forces are closing in on Gaza City in their efforts to end the threat of Hamas. The U.S. says it's beefing up American military presence in the region as well. Israeli forces have cut off northern Gaza, urging thousands of civilians to head south through the last remaining humanitarian corridor. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu frames this fight as the next phase of the global war on terrorism. If the Middle East falls to the axis of terror, Europe will be next, and no one will be safe. This is not a local battle. This is a global battle. The Hamas-run health ministry said more than 10,000 Palestinians have been killed since the beginning of the war. The Israeli-Hamas war is hit home in Georgia. 20-year-old Elisheva Rose Ida Lubin lost her life defending Israel. She grew up in Dunwoody but was serving with the Israeli Border Patrol when she was killed. Governor Kemp said tonight her courage and commitment to fighting evil is an inspiration to us all. And we will continue to keep her family and loved ones in our thoughts and prayers during this difficult time. Police say in Indiana... The incident happened Friday night in Indianapolis. The 34-year-old woman told police she crashed into the school on purpose because she was offended by what she referred to as, quote, Hebrew-Israelite symbol on the front of the building. In fact, the Anti-Defamation League labels the school as extreme and anti-Semitic. Police say the woman also made reference to, quote, her people back in Palestine. She's set to make her first court appearance on Wednesday. <laughs> is in custody tonight but you can still see just over here uh, there is a lots of debris left over from that crash uh, scattered throughout the street here and surveillance from a nearby convenience store captured the moments just before impact surveillance video seen here gives a glimpse into the seconds just before this aps school bus's normal route is cut short when a driver fleeing from georgia state patrol troopers runs a red light crashing into it it happened at the intersection of Mount Gilead Road and Campbellton Road Monday afternoon. From there, you see multiple people in the car take off on foot and troopers follow. Authorities say this all started after the driver refused to stop when troopers attempted to pull them over. The driver was believed to be in a stolen car. A witness who did not want to speak on camera said he saw it all happen and heard about 10 shots fired not long after the crash. GBI officials confirmed one of the men, later identified as 18-year-old Jerron Peters, fired a handgun at troopers several times and troopers returned fire before they lost him. Officials say they found Peters being chased by a dog in a nearby neighborhood shortly after he'd attempted to break into two homes in the area he was taken into custody and treated for his injuries once troopers realized he'd been shot atlanta public schools officials said four elementary school students were on board the bus thankfully no injuries were reported the school principal notified parents some students were picked up from the scene while others were dropped off by a second school bus it's unclear what charges Jerron faces tonight, and there's also no word on the locations of any of the other suspects that were involved, but we are told the investigation is ongoing. That's the latest here live in Southwest Atlanta. Joy Dukes, Fox 5 Wow, News. some dramatic video there, Joy. Thanks. New High school teacher Kiana Ashi Renee Davis was arrested over the weekend. According to the indictment, two-year-old Carter Ambrose was struck with a blunt object which resulted in a laceration to the liver. Davis and Keon Devoid Benton were indicted for malice murder, felony murder, cruelty to children in the first degree, aggravated assault, and other charges. A Henry County community is mourning the loss of a McDonough teen who was shot to death yesterday. 14-year-old Darian McNeil accidentally shot himself while at home. Police have released few details about the investigation, but were told two teens who were with the victim reportedly told officers about the accidental shooting. 
On Sunday night, neighborhood children held a candlelight vigil in the cul-de-sac near McNeil's home. Police are still searching for the gunman who opened fire in southeast Atlanta over the weekend, injuring six people. Police say that a group of people were hanging out when a car parked across the street. The suspects get out and start shooting. One of the people is still in critical condition tonight. Police haven't yet released a description of the suspect's car. The investigation is still going on. A man accused in the murder of a Georgia State business student is now walking free. Quintavian Williams recently posted bond after a Fulton County judge set bail at $100,000. Fox News' Christopher King spoke with the victim's sister, who says he should be locked up. Christopher joins us now live with more. Christopher. Tom, Christine, that murderous suspect put up $10,000. Now he's out of jail. The victim's sister can't believe it. Good God. It's beyond concern. A man charged in the murder of Deidre Alexander's brother, Derek, at least until his trial, is now out on the streets. That's probably the most frustrating part. Derek Alexander was shot and killed last April as he sat in a car at the Creekside and Adamsville community on Martin Luther King Jr. Drive in southwest Atlanta. Quintavion Williams is the only man so far charged in the murder. It was really egregious and it was monstrous. Williams last Friday posted the required 10% of $100,000 bond. That's $10,000. He must also wear an ankle monitor. That ankle monitor is not tamper proof. Um, so it's one of those things that, you know, if he messes with it, um, you know, it could end up not being able to find him and then he could just be gone. And now the man with a murder charge hanging over him is free. Given his charges, I don't think he should have been granted a bond. Alexander, at the very least, wanted a significantly higher bond. It should have started maybe at 250000 then at least that 10% puts us at twenty five. Derek majored in business administration at Georgia State University. He loves soccer, even played it for a bit in Europe. Police are still looking for another man you see in this surveillance video. Alexander, who's also a local prosecutor, finds that unnerving. And that could be somebody's next door neighbor, and you have no idea. Now we call the Fulton County DA's office. We are still waiting for a response. In the meantime, Alan says police may be looking for another person of interest. And she says she wants all the people responsible for her brother's murder to get life behind bars. We're live at the Fulton County Courthouse. Christopher King, Fox 5 News. All right. The boy was walking near the East College Avenue Commerce Drive area near the Avondale Marta stop when a car hit and killed him. Police haven't released the boy's name or the name of the driver. A Shambly police chase ends with a crash in Doraville. Police say the suspect broke into a car, stealing $4,000 in cash at the Whole Foods on Peachtree Boulevard. A Shambly officer found the car on Buford Highway. The suspect hit a pole and tried to run off, but was stopped by officers. One of the Shambly police officers has minor injuries. The suspect was charged with two counts of felony entering auto and obstruction. Dozens of activists appear before a Fulton County judge accused of violent acts at the planned police training center. The head on News Edge and look at what charges they... Citing an increase in pedestrian deaths. But critics say right turns on red are not to blame. Let's take a look. More and more U.S. cities are thinking about banning right turns at a red light as there are more reports of pedestrian deaths. San Francisco leaders recently voted to urge their transportation agency to ban right on red across the city. Other major cities such as Los Angeles, Seattle, and Denver are considering similar bans. Luke Bornheimer, a San Francisco resident, started the letter campaign about a month ago. The letter states, implementing no turn on red increases safety for people crossing the street, especially children, families, seniors, and people living with disabilities, as well as people on bikes and scooters. Critics argue that banning right on red will not only inconvenience motorists, but also slow down commuter buses and deliveries. Jay Bieber, executive policy director at the National Motorist Association, oh, called it a fallacy to assume such blanket bans would make streets safer. 
His advocacy organization for drivers has an upcoming study that analyzes California crash data from 2011 to 2019 and finds that drivers turning right on red accounted for only about one pedestrian death and less than one bicyclist death statewide every two years. Safety advocates counter that official crash reports are often mislabeled. According to a national report by the Governor's Highway Safety Association, more than 7,500 people walking were struck and killed by automobiles in 2022, the highest number since 1981. That number includes all accidents, not just those involving right turns on red. The spike was attributed in part to an increase in larger vehicles such as SUVs and pickup trucks on the road. However, there are no recent nationwide studies on how many people are hurt or killed by right-turning drivers. Right on Red became common following a federal law passed in 1973 in response to a fuel shortage at the time. Federal officials only provided funding for land-related projects to a state if it allowed cars to turn right on red except in specific, clearly marked areas. Most of New York City has never allowed such turns. And last year, Washington, D.C. approved a red on red ban that takes effect in 2025. Another idiot decision by the federal government.